you go. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, everybody. It's January 2nd. What a year. Last year, right? Uh, it just flew by so, so fast. Now we're here in 2024. And today we actually have a really, really good friend of ours, Mike, um, who we have to open up this amazing year, this 2024. And like we always say, welcome to the Cashflow Empire, where we like to talk about, you know, the dirty, the ugly, the truth, and just everything about real estate, especially multifamily. We like to target that a lot here, right, guys? So today's special guest to start off our amazing 2024 year, which I think all you guys are going to absolute love because Mike has hell of experience. You know, he's done a lot and uh, I think we can learn something from Mike tonight. And uh, yeah, that being said, Mike, what is up? How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I, uh, like I said early, you know, I'm glad that uh, you guys finally reached out and I can't think of a better way to start the new year than to be on with you guys. And what a great group of people turn out, you know, first of the year, man, let's rock and roll this year. That's all I got to say. Let's freaking go. Let's freaking go. And for those that don't know who Mike is, man, and usually, I mean, we, we like to ask the question, who, who's Mike, you know, who is Mike, where are you from? And, and, and let, let's just start, let's start, let's start right there. All right. Um, so Mike Morowski, I am, uh, I have this, um, I'm the uh, chief investment officer for a multifamily hedge fund. We buy multifamily products in pretty uh, primary markets, very market-driven investment group. And we raise capital and partner with private investors to share in the profits. Uh, that's my day job. My side hustle is I, I work with uh, individuals, teaching them how to do that. And I do some training and help people uh, syndicate either their first or their next multifamily deal. So uh, I like what you said early, Serge, about partnering with people. And, and I'm always, uh, you know, loving being on these platforms because you never know who you're going to meet. And, you know, I always believe the the different rooms you're in, you get to hang out with people that are smarter than you. And that's why I'm here with you guys. So. Nice, nice. And guys, I mean, this is I, I think, Mike, I, I like that you you're you're more than welcome to like share your knowledge and to help people just because uh, we do have a lot of first time investors in the room. Um, there's a lot of people that say, well, guys, I don't I don't know anybody or I don't know any sponsors. Well, guys, we got Mike in the house that's able to come in and help you get to that next level, you know, and, and, and this is what's amazing about what is it that we do, you know, every Tuesday night is just kind of connecting people. Uh, with my, like connecting people with pre people like Mike. So that's amazing. So, so Mike, uh, really quick, where are you from and where'd you, when did you start your multifamily journey? Yeah. So I've been in the business 30 years, um, started out at a construction company. I'm from Chicago. Uh, I had a construction company building about 25 residential, uh, home additions, room additions a year. And, um, I burned out and I decided, you know, like any entrepreneur, you know, you're, you're in business doing uh, everything, right? Your, your marketing, your sales, you are bookkeeping, you're ordering product, you're scheduling, you're, you know, doing everything in the business that needs to be done. And, you know, I just burned out on what I was doing. Um, so I took a year off um, and I fell into house hacking. I bought a couple of two flats and, um, house hack those long before it was sexy. You know, back when I was doing it, people were like, you're doing what? And now everybody seems to house hack to get into the investment business. Um, I uh, met a real estate agent along the way who was extremely successful and went to him, said, hey, I think I'd like to go in this business. And he encouraged me to go in the real estate business. So I went in as a real estate sales agent. My first nine months in the business, I sold 78 single family houses, uh, went on to build a team. We sold about 120, 130 houses a year and did that consecutively for about 12 years. Uh, 2005, I saw the market starting to shift. And if you guys want to, uh, you know, unpack anything along the way, let me know. Otherwise, I'll just I'll just roll through the whole thing. So um, 2005, I, I, I saw the market starting to shift didn't know really what was going to happen or where the market was going to go. I just knew I wasn't going to keep the same production that I had been uh, held up for the last several years. 
I had a team of people working for me and, and needed to go do something else that was going to keep them all employed. So I went in the apartment business. You know, I always had this dream or this vision of building a syndication company. And, and I knew the basics, right? In the beginning, I knew, hey, you raise private capital, you marry it with a great real estate deal, you stay in the middle. And as long as everything goes well, everybody makes money. Well, um, in 2005, I bought my first multifamily deal. It was an 11 unit apartment building outside of Chicago and um, thought it would be an easy transition going from real estate sales into the apartment business. Um, and I had done a couple of hundred fix and flips and buy and holds and fix and holds along the way. Um, in in the process of, of being in the real estate business over the years. And I thought I knew it, but I'll tell you what, I got in the multifamily business and the first time somebody said NOI or cap rate or yield maintenance, I went, what? And realized very quickly I needed to learn a lot. Um, but what was interesting was that first deal helped me learn what I needed to learn and how to build a buying strategy and how to move forward. But funny thing, I raised capital on that first deal, um, kind of on an accident. And I syndicated my first deal. And I said, geez, I'm in the business now. And over the next 30 months, I went out and I raised about $18 million. I bought 4,000 apartments in five markets. Matter of fact, you guys, we had a big fo uh, footprint in the Dallas Fort Worth market. Um, I had about 2,200 units in that market. And 2008 rolled around. And uh, in 2008, we all know what happened, the great economic crisis. Well, we hit a wall. And I always tell people I made five mistakes along the way. Um, I grew too fast as a company. I, I had, you know, there was no need to go buy two or 3,000 units in one year and try and stabilize those or, or handle those. But, but I grew a hundred million dollar company because we also had a property management company that um, managed about 7,500 units uh, in those markets. And um, 2008 rolled around and we were very unstable as a company. So we started to unravel. By 2010, uh, we had really hit the skids uh, we were over leveraged. Uh, I bought, you know, uh, $60 million worth of real estate at 85% loan to value. And the one thing I would tell people is don't buy any deals unless you're at least 65% LTV in those deals. You need that equity piece in order to survive. Um, the other uh, the other challenge was that, you know, I grew this company to over 100 employees in that time and was undercapitalized to do that. So 2008 rolls around. We start to unravel as a company. Um, I try to save my company uh, so that we don't lose everything and that my investors don't get hurt. And in hindsight, what I should have done was I should have let maybe a dozen of my deals go to foreclosure. And a few of my investors get hurt. But what I tried to do was save everybody. So I started to move money from my profitable companies to my non-profitable deals. And I had about 38 different deals at the time. And my accountant and my attorney both said, hey, it's okay to do that. Just leave a paper trail. And um, I ultimately imploded because, uh, you know, my thought was, hey, this is just going to be a recession. It's going to last 17 or 18 months. There'll be a 10 or 12 percent correction in the market. The markets will bounce back. I can put the money back and then I'm a hero. Well, in reality, we all know that that uh, you know, economic crisis went on for seven or eight years, 45, 47 percent correction in the market. It's kind of hard to weather that storm. So in the midst of moving all that money, um, I didn't tell my investors what I was doing. And I wound up uh, being charged on wire fraud and mail fraud charges and wound up being sentenced to 10 years in federal prison. So, um, and, and I always tell people, I say, hey, I never flew private. I didn't have a big boat. I didn't have a fancy house or a big car. I was a neighborhood baseball coach. I was home every night for dinner. 
And I got ripped from that to live in a 12 by 12 room with three men I didn't know, nor did I like, wondering what the hell happened in my life. So we uh, got wiped out as a company, um, went to prison in 2013 and came home. I actually came home in 2020, right when they closed the world down for the pandemic. Um, but, you know, a lot of people would say, wow, you know, you lost everything that's got to be terrible. It really, you know, it was, it was a bad situation, but I learned a lot along the way. You know, I, I always tell people, I say, hey, look, I, I had all this great success and I lost it all. I lost a hundred million dollar company, but I was able to rebound. You know, while I was in prison, I wrote two books. I wrote a book called Exit Plan your complete guide to multifamily investing and why you need an exit plan before you buy. I wrote a book on property management. Um, I wrote an ethics course. I taught real estate investing, property management and ethics in prison. I was on an outreach program and went into the community and told my story to small business owners. I, I went to college, I got a bachelor's degree in theology I came home from prison thinking I was going to go into coaching and training business, and that's just what I would do, which I did. I, I started a, a small coaching and training company, but I also knew that I was going to have to learn how to underwrite again, uh, and because if I was going to teach that to the people that I coached, and I started to underwrite deals. Well, I found a I found a deal in Florida back in two thousand and twenty. Uh, 2021, then I went to two of my coaching clients and wound up partnering with them on, on that first multifamily deal. Along the way, my securities attorney said, hey, I think I can get you approved by the SEC to go back and be an issuer of security, a sponsor of deals, which I was able to do. So, you know, my life has kind of come full circle. Like I said, I had all this great success, lost everything, and now we're we're buying deals again, syndicating, uh, raising capital, and I'm also teaching people how to do that and not make the same mistakes that I made along the way. Awesome, man. No, really, uh, John, John, really quick, can I say something? Comment. I knew I knew you were gonna say something. That's why I think easy, guys. Uh, easy. <laughs> no, nah, hey, Mike. Uh, I just. For you to stand up here just to kind of just show that vulnerability of what happened to you, uh, that means a lot to me. And I think uh, it should mean a lot to everybody just because, you know, it could be hard to talk about your past. It could be hard about talk about the mistakes you made. Um, so so for you to come up here to share with us, man, I really do appreciate it. And I, if everybody appreciates it, put some hand claps, put some 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 show some love to Mike, you know, uh, in the chat for me, please. And and Mike, thank you once again for that. And uh, you know, you inspire me, and and you really do inspire me, and really just kind of, in in a way of someone that lost it all but is building it back up, and just doing it all over again after losing it all. You know, so yeah. you're you're able to you're you're a proven concept. You're a proven concept of that of somebody that's actually lost it all and is building it right back up. So you hear it all the time. I hear a lot of like guys that you know on podcasts, and and you know like that I don't even know, you know, but to know somebody that's actually doing it, uh, super inspirational. So man, uh, thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah, you bet, Sergio. Hey, you know, and let me just say this. The reason I share it is because I want people to understand you can't let your past define your future. This is a big thing for me. And I want people, you know, I think that there's a lot of people that are trapped in prisons in their own mind. Oh, I don't know anybody to raise capital from. Oh, I don't have any money. I can't do this on my own. You know, and I think we tell ourselves these stories. I might have been behind a wall thinking I'd never come out and do this again. But I think just people who aren't even, you know, are in prisons in their own mind thinking they can't move beyond what happened. I think there's a lot of people that are trapped by addiction um, maybe things that have happened to them in their past, as far as maybe, you know, addiction, sexual abuse, you know, physical abuse, things like that in their life. Um, and they think they can't go forward. Well, I just want people to see, I want to set that example that no matter what happened in your past, or no matter who you are or where you are in your life, 
you can go accomplish it if you really want to go accomplish it. Not saying it's easy, but you can do it. If you're willing to put the work in, if you're willing to put the effort in, you can go back and bounce back from anything. And we're all going to have stumbles in there. Awesome, awesome, Mike. Yeah, no, I'm going to take this question from uh, Rosalba. Uh, she just typed in the chat, uh, how do you build your credibility back once you came out of prison, right? So was it, fine, was it hard to find partners? Yeah, you know, what a great question, right? Um, first of all, I'm very transparent. As you as you can see, I tell my story. I, I tell my story every chance I get. Every investor that is invested with me knows my history, knows my story. And I want people to know. Um, I think there's there's a message in the mistakes, right, of what not to do. You know, I, to, I, I said, you know, I grew too fast. Um, I was overcapitalized. Uh, or over leveraged, undercapitalized, but I also didn't pay attention to the details. You know, John, uh, at the beginning, we were talking about asset management, right? And, you know, you've got to know how to asset manage. I mean, there's 12 or 13 things that you have to know on a weekly basis from your property management team. And, and those are the things that if you get really good at those, you make sure that deals don't fall out. And then, you know, guys, I'm going to tell you, one thing that I did was I didn't listen to people around me who, who really had my back. And I didn't pay attention to, to those red flags. And, and I had people tell me, hey, I don't like what's going on. I don't trust this person. I don't like what this person's doing. And I said, ah, don't worry about it. I have it under control. And I didn't, you know, I was, uh, you know, kind of trying to build, you know, fight this battle when I should have really kind of settled back a little bit and done things in a different light. And those are the examples I want people to see how to uh, not fall into those challenges. Um, you know, I think we're coming out of a market right now that, uh, you know, you need to mitigate your way through and be able to understand some of the dynamics that are going on and where you're at in your own deals or deals that you're moving into. So how do I build my credibility back? It's just by being transparent. It's being honest with people and telling people where I'm at. And, you know, there's been, you know, there's been a number of people that have said, Hey, uh, you know, I, I'm not interested in doing business with you and, and that's okay. I can't let that affect me or, or affect my forward motion. And so either people, you know, people are going to like you or they're going to not like you. There's not really much in between, no matter whether you made a mistake or didn't make a mistake. It's just a numbers game. Nice, nice. And it looks like Mr. Jimmy Lou. Jimmy Lou, welcome, brother. You got a question? Thanks, Sergio. Hi, Mike. Thanks for sharing your uh, stories. Very uh, inspiring for a lot of people here. I uh, just don't want to get into all the weeds, but I just want to have that clarify. Is um, so you have these thirty-eight deals at the at the time, and uh, somehow you're using your profits from the profitable deals and pay for the 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 pro the one that is not profitable. Um, how what was the structure like? Was this a single syndication for each deal, or was it because some people they have done with put it in a funds where they have you know, uh, roll up to other funds and pay it back to individual deals. So what was your structure and why was it a violation? So Jimmy, a uh, great question. And I appreciate you asking. So um, a decade ago when we were doing this, funds were not as popular as they are today. Um, so they were all single LLCs, single syndication deals. So Jimmy, if you invested in, you know, ABC, um, but weren't invested in CDF um, and I took your money from ABC and moved it into the other deal, I was really violating your trust against me. And, you know, cause I didn't disclose that to you. So I was, I was taking profits that companies were being profit profitable with and moving them into other companies to shore up the whole thing, thinking the markets had bounced back. And I'd be able to put all the money back when the when the markets, you know, turned again. But it didn't happen. Good. 
guess nice. uh, I guess uh, he answered your question, right, Jimmy? Yep. Thank <laughs> you. Awesome, awesome, Mike. Uh, and I got a question before I let I let Sergio go for the next one. So, hey, wait, one one thing, one just quick yeah, recap on that for Jimmy um, and everybody else. Even if you have a fund and you're moving money, you know, around in that fund or to another fund, um, you, you you need to you, you need to be careful. Don't you know? Don't do it because it, it it can cause some issues for you, especially long term. So that's good. That's good. Good, good stuff, right? So. So hey, hey Mike, um, you know we see a lot of people, and, and you 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 say earlier that you didn't disclose that with investor, right? Like you wish you were telling people, okay, we're not doing doing good with the deals and stuff like that. We're seeing this right now, you know, all these properties going to foreclosures, and you know what is happening right now, especially, you know, next year a, a lot of more deals are gonna come to for sale, right? So so if you were in that situation again. Right. Uh, what would you be doing different? Oh, um, so if I was in that situation again, the deals that were bad, I'd have let them go to foreclosure. I'd have let you know. I had I had about two hundred and forty investors. I'd have let twenty five investors get hurt. Um, you know, I wouldn't have try. I wouldn't try to save everybody as I did back then. So um, I I totally would would look at it differently today, and I would continue to to you know manage the the good deals and let the bad deals go go south the difference today is though i don't have a deal that i'm 85 percent leveraged in i have i have deals that i am 65 percent uh leveraged in and so my ltv is at 65 percent i have fixed rate debt i have a long runway on that fixed rate debt and, um, you know, my debt is lower than what cap rates are. So I'm in a better position today, operational wise, and we'll be able to withstand this storm on, on the units that we do own today. Awesome, awesome. That was great. Um, I will let uh, Ashley go. Hey, Ashley. Welcome. Hey, guys. Thank you. Um, well, I really like your your story i think actually um i've met some people who kind of have a similar background to what you went through and um i'm proud to say for you at least you're the most positive person that i've seen go through something like that where i think you were trying to turn in a bad situation into a good one and it didn't really work out you know that way so i give you props and a lot of respect for coming out of that and you have a great attitude and a lot of integrity and i admire that Thank you, um, Ashley. I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, you're amazing. You're amazing. So I would love for you to talk to some people that I know that went through something similar. They're they're back on top again, but I feel like they still live under some shame. And I'm to me, I'm I don't see it that way. I see it as I'm grateful for the wisdom that they have now so that they can teach, you know, other people, you know, how to make better decisions in those type of situations. So you did good. Um, I wanted to ask you about your books. Um, if you could put the links here in the chat, actually, because the question Jonathan had, I had that question. So, or if you could at least tell us what books you've, you've written. Yeah, so um, my the first book is Exit Plan. It, uh, it's your complete guide to multifamily investing and why you need an exit plan. And then the second one is called Winning Strategies for Property Management. I'll put the link to the website um, in the uh, in the chat. Uh, they're cheaper, you know. It's less expensive if you go get them at uh, at my website than it is on Amazon. So, awesome! Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Great, great question and great words by Ashley. Ashley, I'm sorry I didn't answer the phone. I will stuff in my face before this call. I will call you after. Yeah, I, I thought so. I thought so. No, no yeah. worries. Sorry, sorry. I suck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. Miles an hour. Yeah. Uh, I get awesome. It. So, Jake, Jake, what's up, Jake? Glad to have you on again. Hey, what's up, guys? Thanks for having me. And yes, Mike, sir. thank you so much for sharing. That is quite the story, and honestly, inspirational. So, I uh, thank you so much for sharing. It sounds it's an amazing story. So, 
Um, my question to you, Mike, is I know you talked about some of the lessons you learned, but did you change the deal structure that you were using before the incident versus after? Are you still following essentially the same strategy and the same syndication deal structure, or did you change it at all? Um, that's a great question. So, you know, one of the things that I did back then, Jake, was um, I took out of my operating documents uh, the ability for a cash call. So one of the one of the the hooks, so to call it, that you know helped investors get over you know the their you know doubt of investing was I took out of my operating documents that if there was a problem we would ever have a cash call, and when the problems arose, and I didn't think you know the market was going pretty much on an upward trend at that point. Uh, in 2006, 2007, uh, you couldn't make a mistake and banks were throwing money at you and people were throwing money at you. Uh, a little bit different than the last couple of years had been. And so when we got to a point where there was an issue, we didn't have any leverage to go back to our investors and do a capital call. So that was one thing. Uh, today, I leave my cap those capital call um the capital call language in my documents in order for people to, you know, know that if there's a challenge, we may come back and, and, and do a capital call on a deal. Um, as far as structure goes, no, the structure is about this, you know, is pretty much the same as it was a decade ago, you know, 70, 30 split, 70% to the LPs, 30% to the, to the uh, GPs. I don't do any, uh, waterfalls on my deals. I keep them very simple, uh, straight 70, 30. And, you know, it's, it, it, it's about, you know, really making sure the property perform for the investors. So I hope that answers your question. If, if you need any more uh, color on that, let me know. No, that was awesome. Thank you. What did you, what do you mean by waterfalls though? Uh -huh. See, that's why I don't put them in there. So a waterfall would be um, if, um, so I start my deal at a 70-30 and um, I'm going to do a preferred rate of return of 7%. Well, anything above a 7%, we know gets split 70-30 between the LPs and the GP. Well, what happens if I get my deal to 8%? Well, if I hit 8%, now the waterfall would kick in. And this is these are mostly done on institutional deals. Um, but it, the waterfall would kick in. And now instead of a 70-30, anything over an 8% is now a 80-20. Uh, so now it causes me as the GP to work a little bit harder to make sure that the deal is, is throwing off better NOI and better cash flow so that I can get to that next you know, to that 80-20 on the waterfall. And then there, there could be a, a third step in it also. You know, let's say I got to 9%. At 9%, the deal will go to a 50-50 split. And, you know, I'd make more money as a GP. And I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Not It'd be a 70-30, go to 60-40, and then a 50-50 um, split right. beyond that. So um, that's how a waterfall would work. It's a pretty convoluted, a system to put together. I can do it in my underwriting model, but um, it's hard to explain to the average investor. So I just keep it simple at 70-30. Yeah, pe people get, get tend to get scared, right? Just like, oh no, that sounds really complicated. So I, I prefer not to invest. <laughs> right, exactly. Right. Is that That's why true, John. you took it out? Is because it, it because it deterred people or because it made things complicated? Or why, why exactly do you not do that? Just want him. You know, John's got the best answer. He says when it's overly complicated, people get afraid of that. Sure. So, yeah. Okay. You know, it's just like uh, telling somebody it's too good to be true, right? You know, those two things, I think, uh, when we're raising capital, um, take us out of the game. If it's too good to be true or if it's overly complicated, um, people tend to say no. Perfect. Thank you so much. Man, that was a uh, good, great questions, great questions. And so, Mike, I want to I want to keep 
uh, and and guys, obviously, feel free to if you're kind of shy to ask a question and raise your hand. Uh, feel free to ask a question in the chat. Do not be scared. But uh, so so going back to Mike, Mike. So you you know, you do some time now. You 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 get out. You're 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 back in the game. You know. Um, so, so what you, what do you got going on now? I mean, I know, I know we talked a lot about the past, some lessons learned, some things you'll do different, but, uh, what do you currently got going on now? You know, after, after this, uh, this whole experience that you had in your life? Yeah, great question. So, you know, here's what I'll tell you. We underwrote a billion dollars in transactions, uh, over an eight month period, uh, between June and January of 22, and we couldn't get anything to pencil. We finally came across a five property portfolio that was off market and we've been um, getting that deal closed over the last uh, eight months. So we uh, were, you know, it, we have two more deals to close that'll put us at about 500 units closed. Um, you know, I've been back in the game for maybe three years uh, at, at the most and, you know, have 500 units already closed. Um, the goal in 2024 is to partner with, with individuals on the GP side, as well as the LP side, and to get 500 to a thousand more units closed in 2024. Um, I, you know, I have a very strong underwriting team and a very strong operations team uh and you know it's it's just we're we're growing uh as a company you know um and i also uh i do some some training so i have a group training platform that we meet once a week i have uh you know i i really cover five pillars five things that i think we all need to look at in the multifamily business and I teach people how to design their portfolio, design their goals, and, and where do you want to go and how do you want to get there? Um, I talk about the language in multifamily, um, everything from, you know, what NOI is to how do we uh, build a buying strategy? How do we, you know, locate the best deals? You know, I think there's a whole different language, especially if you're coming from single family or another uh, a a um, asset class. Um, my third pillar is that I, I teach money mass market mastery, right? Um, how to underwrite deals. I have a institutional underwriting tool that we've built over the last 20 years that, um, you know, does things like um, put in the waterfalls if you want them. But, um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a great tool for people to use and learn how to underwrite. And then I teach due diligence, you know. Here's the other thing, that first deal I did, I did no due diligence. I didn't do any upfront um, inspections of the property. I did no due diligence. I didn't check markets. So I teach that piece of how do we look at markets? How do we look at deals? How do we do the due diligence? And um, then bringing the deal home, maximizing the ROI, which is operations and asset management. And I think that a deal is made or broken on the asset management side. It, it, you're either good at that or you're not good at it. And, and I'll give you an example. I was on an asset management call today. And property management gets on and we meet with our property managers on every one of our properties once a week. And I want to know 13 different things. Well, we start talking about repairs and maintenance. And all of a sudden she's talking about money that we got from housing. And I, I had to say on the call, hey, listen, can we just stay on one topic at a time? Let's stay on track so we don't get confused. And you know, if you're not asset managing and you're not going through those 13 things and understanding uh, the fundamentals behind each one of them, you're, you're not gonna run that deal like you need to run it. And right now, when um, we're coming out of a down market and going into the next bull run, this is where you're gonna. This is where wealth is gonna be created, and you know, understanding those five pillars and how they all work in your multifamily business is what'll help drive people's business to the next stage. 
and that's what I teach. So we meet once a week. I have a video library. I have a document uh, library. People have access to that. They have access to my database. They have access to my uh, to people around me. And you know, I have a tendency to partner with people on deals. So awesome, Mike. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And and yeah, what about to to have one of the biggest opportunities in history in, in real estate? You know, so so we know that. That's why we tell people, hey, guys, you know, just come to this call, show up here, start networking, you know, and never stop meeting people, right? Because especially in, about what is coming, it, it, I think that is, is key to in order to grow, right? So, so Mike, um, you, you talk a lot about capital raising and, and, and all the stuff that you raise money for deals and, and all of that. So do you have any any tips or any strategies that you can share about, about that, right? Because... You know, I think that's a, I, I think you have a strong or, or good method, right? Especially after, you know, the same question that we asked earlier, right? Just to build credibility again. Yeah. So, so John, you know, this might be a good segue to that question, but uh, Trey asked a question about how am I sourcing off market deals? And, and this is one of the things that, that I, I, I train on is how to find the best on and off market deals and what to look for in those deals right now. But it's relationships. You know, that's the short answer. It's who do you have relationships with? And, you, you know, because every broker out there has a pocket listing and, you know, has a listing that the seller didn't sell it six months or a year ago and says, hey, you know what? If, you, if somebody comes along and they want to buy it, I'll sell it. So, you know, you've got to build strong relationships. And, and it's not just finding deals, but it's building strong relationships with people when you're raising capital on deals. Um, you, you know, one of the things I think that we miss as multifamily investors is, is, um, that we were not taught from day one to talk to everybody about what you're doing and start building your database. You need to be building your database from day one with potential investors. So, hey, um, Tony, if, if I met you um, today for the first time and we were at a networking event, I would want to, you know, of course, I'm going to ask you about you. You're going to ask me about me. I'm going to tell you I'm the chief investment officer for a multifamily hedge fund. And we partner with people like you to, uh, to share in the profits of our deals. Hey, Tony, is that something you'd be interested in? And, and you know what? Tony's going to say, no, I'm not. But my uncle John is. Or Tony's going to say, yeah, tell me more. And, and I'm going to build my database from that, right? But we need to do that from the day we come in the business because the bigger your database, that is, that's your keys to the kingdom because we're in a business that's, you know, a product of capital. And, and the more we, we have uh, resources to capital, um, the, better, the better deals you're going to buy, the more deals you're going to buy. That was a hell of a question and a, a good good answer, Mike. And before Tony, we are you in? <laughs> Tony, Tony's in. <laughs> Tony's in. There he goes. All right. Before we go into the breakout rooms, uh, just because I want I want us to get a lot more intimate um, with, with Mike, and you know, some of y'all can ask even more questions. I got I got I got three more. I got one more question, and it's going to require three answers, Mike. You know, um, you've been in the game so long. You've had some ups. You had some downs. There's a lot of first-time multifamily investors in this room right now. What would you go back and give yourself? What are, the, what are the three things that you would go back and probably tell yourself or advise us um, when entering this multifamily, you know, investing industry? You want three answers, Serge? Three answers or, or, or the top three things that come to your mind? Yeah. So the first thing is um, I would have gotten some education first. 
right? Before I jumped into the multifamily business, I'd have got a coach, I'd have got a mentor, I'd have gotten a training program. I would have done something to give me some education so that I understood what NOI meant, what yield maintenance went, how to do due diligence, you know, how to underwrite properly. Because I, if I would have known how to underwrite properly, I would have never bought that first deal. But that's how we learn, right? I was just, I've always been the kind of guy that takes action. The second thing is build relationships. I just talked about it, you know. You don't know who's got money. You don't know who wants to invest. Everybody wants to be in real estate in some form or fashion. Um, you may just be the person that that individual wants to, you know, invest some of their retirement money. So um, you've got to you've got to build relationships. And the third thing is whether you underwrite on your team or not, you need to know how to underwrite. Um, because when you're raising capital, uh, you need to be able to talk about the numbers. So you need to be able to understand those fully. I think those are the three top things for uh, you know that I would say today going into the business, you need to know. Beautiful, beautiful. And before we go to the very, very last question, we did have a last minute question come on. Um, but And before we end this recording, uh, Mike, can you please put your... Uh, contact information so people can get a hold of you. Yeah. Uh, and, and that would be amazing just so we can stay connected. And uh, the last question is, do you work with family offices at all? I, I love that question. And um, the, the short answer is yes, I would. Uh, the longer answer is once I have uh, about 1,500 to 2,000 units under my belt again, and we have a little bit of success, the family office market is a little bit easier to get uh, involved with. They start to pay attention to you. They'll have better conversations with you. Um, so, but until you get to that point, uh, it's a little tougher. It's just like, you know, uh, the institutional market is the next step above family office, right? Once you have three or 5,000 units under your belt, now you can start to talk to insurance companies and hedge funds and things like that so awesome mike mike thank you thank you man so much for for actually sharing that and today for being with us i know that you are really busy right and and we want to bring somebody like you because you know this is not a uh, a game right we need to take this business uh really serious right because the sec all the compliances and everything i mean that's that's actually really important, right? I see some people, uh, you know, posting everywhere, five or six B deals, like, hey, you know, they just are looking to to raise money and because they don't get educated, right? So you just share something about that, getting educated, understand how the business works. And and then I just see people like blowing the chats everywhere, you know, hey, you know, I'll raise, a, invest in my deal, five or six B and, and, and this and that, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, and and that's that's crazy because you know probably they just I don't know get invited and then even the lead sponsors they don't know about it so everybody's just being affected by somebody that is not uh, getting educated so right right and make sure you know if you're a limited partner and you're going into a deal that you vet that sponsor you know there's a lot of a lot of people right now that um, had the wind at their back for a couple of years, did really well, but today are struggling because the market shifted and interest rates changed and bridge loans are coming due. And, and, you know, so just, just walk cautiously, do your betting, you know, and, and here I would just tell anybody, if, if you want to connect, I'm very open to having a conversation. If I can help you um, either do your first multifamily deal or, or do your next one, I'm open to that conversation. You can reach out to me. Uh, you know what? Follow me on social media. I have a, a Facebook group, Multifamily Unplugged. I'm always throwing uh, information out there for people. And uh, we're, you know, we're pretty robust on, on uh, all the social media platforms. So. Awesome. Awesome. Mike, before we go into the break breakout rooms, I want to just thank you so much just for coming in and, 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 you know, bringing some value to our community, showing a lot of love and, and really just starting a year off with the bang, 
you know, just because uh, we're all we're all inspired, we're all motivated. We just got back from a Grand Cardone event a couple of weeks ago, uh, so we're we're trying to just keep going. So uh, to, to sit here and, and listen to your story, Mike, and and just just it means a lot. And we're gonna just stay hungry, stay motivated, and keep going. So that being said, uh, thank you so much, Mike, for for joining our podcast tonight.